I'm in Exodus chapter 21, and I'm going to be looking at <clears throat> more rules for Israel. You know, we just got done looking at Exodus 20, where you saw the Ten Commandments, and those sum up the law for you. And then you get to 21, and he breaks down even more stuff. It's not just the Ten Commandments, you see. Those are like summing up everything. But then he's also going to break it down and show you all kinds of stuff. In this chapter alone, you got masters and servants and rules for them. You got manslayers, men that kill others. And making things good, how to make things good with people. And then minding what we would call today leash laws. So let's look at it real quick. Chapter 21, verse 1. It says, Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. So the judgments. Judgments in addition to the Ten Commandments. And judgments are written judicial decisions. You've got God's judgments right here in the Word of God. You know, everybody says, Judge not lest you be judged. But they don't realize that the Lord wants you to judge. 1 Corinthians 2.15 says, Ye that are spiritual judgeth all things. In Philippians 1, 9 through 10, he talks about how he, uh, Paul talks about judgment and that he wants, wants them to approve things that are excellent. To approve things that are excellent, you got to make judgments. you got to say, is this right or is it wrong? Can I approve this or should I not approve of this? You know, in uh, 1 Corinthians 6, he's going to... 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Look at that real quick. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. He says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? You've got a book of judgments here. You can make judgment calls. And in Isaiah 5, 7, the Lord talks about how he looked, he looked for judgment, but he didn't find it. Is your life just absent of judgment? God's looking for you to judge, make judgment calls. And he's gave you a book of judgments. You've already got the judgments wrote out in the Bible. You just got to go by them. So now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. Now verse 2. Now we're going to look at masters and servants. And rules concerning them. It says if thou buy an Hebrew servant. Six years he shall serve. And in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. Okay, in the seventh year, he goes out free for nothing. Doesn't have to pay anything to go free. And, you know, there are some loopholes in there that he, he might could go out before seven years. But as a general rule, the seventh year, he goes out free for nothing. So people think, well, the Bible's uh, all about slavery. God loves slavery. Not the type of slavery that you're thinking. Uh, that's why there's rules concerning servants here. You have to treat the servants right the master has to treat the servants right so the servant can go and he can serve six year and go out free in the seventh year and he doesn't have to pay his way out and the servant is a picture of the lord jesus christ you can find jesus on every page because jesus took on him the form of a servant philippians 2 7 look at philippians 2 7 Philippians 2 and verse 7, it says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the Lord Jesus Christ is pictured by the servant. And consider that seventh year, how the servant goes free. You see, there's... 6,000 years of human history, right? And then the 7,000th year is when the Lord's reigning. You got 6,000 years of human history. Then you got that other 1,000 years, the 7,000th year. That's the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ where he'll be king. So you got 6,000 years of just 
man making a mess of things and then you got from the 6,000th year to the 7,000th you got the Lord reigning so there's the picture there six years he'll reign in the seventh year the servant goes free the Lord took, takes on the form of a servant deals with us for 6,000 years down here and then in that 7,000th year from the 6,000th to the 7,000th year you got the millennium where he'll be king so you see the similarities there now, verse 3, 21, 3. If he came in by himself, he should go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife should go out with him. So the servant's wife also goes out free. If, she, if his wife came in with him as a servant, she also gets to go out free. The master just can't say, okay, you're leaving, so I'm taking your wife too. You see how these the Lord lays down these rules in favor of the servant. If she came in with him, she goes out with him. Just like we're going to go out free from this world with the bridegroom. Jesus Christ became a servant. He's the bridegroom. At the rapture, we go out free with him. Now, verse 4. If his master have given him a wife... And she have borne him sons or daughters. The wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Okay, this is a little bit different here. If the master had given him a wife, which would have been a stranger, you know, not a Hebrew most likely, because in Leviticus 25, 45 through 46, it talks about, let's just go there, Leviticus 25, 45 it says, Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you, to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule one over another with rigor. So you see, they got strangers... They, uh, if, if they came in contact when, with in war and they kept these women, the enemy's women in war, those would become their servants and they would eventually become their servants' wives. So you see, if, if you became a servant and you got a wife given to you by the master then when you go out free, you couldn't just take her because that was the possession of the master. So if the master had given him a wife, then his wife and kids must stay behind. They couldn't go out free with him after seven years. But here's the honorable thing for the servant to do. Look at verse 5, 21, 5. And if the servant shall plainly say, plainly says it, I love my master, my wife, and my children. I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall serve him forever. So he's, he's you know, it's time for him to go out free. But he's he says, I don't want to go free because I can't take my wife and my children with me. And I love my master. I love my wife. I love my children. I want to stay a servant. Then the master would bring him to the doorpost and take an awl and bore it through his ear, kind of like an earring, and that shows he is a servant forever. So that is another picture. So the honorable thing is for him to become a servant forever, to keep his wife and his children. And that picture is how Jesus Christ became a servant. He humbled himself, came down here to be a servant. A king made a servant, all because he loved his master. He loved the father. He loved his wife, the bride, and he loved his children. Let's look at some verses that go along with that. You see, me and you as safe people, we make up the body of Christ, which is also the bride of Christ. It says in Ephesians 5.23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You see the picture? You and the Lord Jesus Christ, your relationship is compared to the husband and wife relationship. And Jesus gave himself for his bride. Just like this servant gives himself, becomes a servant forever to keep his bride. And we're also children. Roman, look at Romans 8. Romans 8 and verse 7. It says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Jesus Christ, he, he that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. And it, it goes on in Romans eight seventeen, and it says, And if children, or Romans eight sixteen, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. you got the Spirit of God in you. You've been born into the family of God because of the Spirit. And the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. So the moment you got saved, the Spirit came in you. You were baptized into the body of Christ. You were born into the family of God. You are a child of God. You, it's... You see, you're connected to the Lord in so many ways. It compares you to his wife. And it calls you his wife, and it calls you his children. You see, the, the relationship is so tight and thick with the Lord. And <clears throat> so Jesus Christ taking on the form of a servant is pictured by that servant back here in Exodus 21 who loved his master just like Jesus loved the Father. He loved his wife, just like Jesus loves the bride. He loved his children, just like the Lord loves his children. So he takes on as a servant for us. So Jesus came down as a servant to get his bride and even got pierced for them. You see, this servant is getting pierced for his bride and his children. It says in verse 6, Then his master shall bring... Him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awe, and he shall serve him forever. Jesus was pierced to get his bride, just like this servant. And let's look at some verses that go along with that. John nineteen thirty six through thirty seven. John 19, 36 through 37. It says, For these things were done that the Scripture should not be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. When he was on the cross, a bone of him was not broken. It says, And again another Scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. They pierced the Lord Jesus Christ. They pierced him in his hands and his feet. Revelation 1, 7. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Zechariah 12.10. Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Psalm twenty two sixteen. Psalm twenty two and verse sixteen. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. A prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. He was nailed to a tree, pierced in his side. That that Roman soldier pierced him in his side and forthwith came out blood and water. So you see, just as this servant back here is pierced to keep his bride and his children. 
and became a servant for him. The Lord Jesus Christ became a servant for us and was pierced to keep us. Now look at Psalm 40 and verse 6. Psalm 40 and verse 6. It says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Notice that sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. And it says, Mine ears hast thou opened. And then you connect that with Hebrews. A verse in Hebrews <clears throat> that's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So you see that in Psalm 40 and verse 6, it says, Mine ears hast, hast thou opened. Jesus Christ got pierced for his bride. And you think about me and you when it comes to this. We're servants. We're bought by a price. You're not your own. You're supposed to glorify God in everything that you do. And if you have your ears opened to the door, just like this servant here, he came to that doorpost and had his ear shot through with an awl. We need our ears opened to the door. Well, who's the door? Let's look at some verses. John 10, 7. John 10, 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Look at John 8, 31. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, <coughs> then are you my disciples indeed. So you, a servant, you got your ears open to the door. And when you got your ears open to the door, Jesus is always saying, you that have an ear to hear, let him hear. You can, you're listening, you're continuing in his word, and you are a good disciple. You'll always be a disciple. And you, you're dedicating yourself to be a disciple forever, putting your ears open to the door. So, now, back in Exodus 21, and verse 7, <clears throat> it says, And if a man sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men's servants do. So what does it mean by go out? Well, like back in verse 2, it says, If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in his seventh he shall go out free for nothing. So the maidservants don't actually go out as the maid, men servants do. The maid servant kind of takes on the role of the, of the wife or the daughter-in-law and she's taken care of as a wife or daughter-in-law even if her master takes another wife. He still has to take care of her. You see how God's not for this thing of you know, these, these skeptics of the Bible going around saying, well, God's for slavery, he's evil, all this stuff. No, even in a master-slave or master-servant situation, and notice it says servant, not slave, he's still catering to these servants, making sure they're treated properly. And the reason people became a servant was not just, it wasn't that they were being kidnapped and, and become servants. It was maybe they were in debt to somebody and they became a servant to pay off that debt maybe they were uh didn't have anything didn't have food didn't have any money and they became a servant just to get out of that situation of being poor so it it really looks like it's not a bad thing and <coughs> It says in verse 8, she, well, she, she doesn't go out as the men's servants do, but verse 8 says, If she please not her master, who hath betrothed her, you know, engaged her to himself, 
Then shall he let her be redeemed. Then shall he let her be redeemed to sell her unto a strange nation. He shall have no power. Uh, he, so he cannot. He can. He cannot just be displeased with her and sell her to this other nation, and then you know only God knows what would happen to her. Then he's not allowed to do that to just sell her to some, you know, heathen nation, and then get money from her. You know, then shall he let her be redeemed to sell her into a strange nation. He shall have no power. He can let her be redeemed by another Hebrew, and then he takes on the role of her husband taking care of her, giving her the things a wife needs, but he cannot sell her to a strange nation. And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. So he has to deal with her like she's a daughter-in-law. She's dealt with just like you would treat your own daughter-in-law. And if he take him another wife, if he just gets another wife, then her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. She still gets all the uh, perks of the of a, being a wife, even though he takes another wife. And then it says, And if he do not these three unto her, then she should go out free without money. So if he cannot let another Hebrew redeemer, if he's unpleased with her, if he won't <clears throat> just let her be his wife, if he won't, if, if she's not going to be his daughter-in-law, then she's just going to go free, out free without money. So you see, it's not a bad deal at all. She's going to be taken care of no matter what, according to these rules. And it says, He that smiteth the son so that he die. All right, well, this gets into another section here in verse 11, or in verse 12. So we saw rules for masters and servants. Now we're looking at rules for murderers and manslayers. You know, thou shalt not kill. You know, you kill somebody, was that what happens if you kill somebody? It says in verse 12, He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. So capital punishment for murder. And that's biblical all the way through. A murderer must be put to death. And let's look at some verses to go along with this. Genesis 9.5 Genesis 9 and verse 5. This is after Noah got off the ark. See, capital punishment had, for, for murder had not been instituted until after Noah got off the ark. That's the reason you see Cain murdered his brother Abel and he wasn't put to death. But it says in Genesis 9 5, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. <coughs> at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So you see, capital punishment for murder before the law. Here you see capital punishment for murder during the law. Now, I'm going to show you uh, Paul... Believing in capital punishment in the New Testament. Acts 25, 11. Paul says about himself, For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. He said, If I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Then you get over to Romans 13, 4, written by Paul, our apostle today. He says, For... Uh, well, start in verse 3, Romans 13, 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So you see, he beareth not the sword in vain. He's the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth 
evil. So you got capital punishment before the law, during the law, after the law. So murderers and manslayers. Murderers must be put to death. Then you get to verse 13. And it says, if a man lie, if a, and if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will point thee a place whither he shall flee. So if a man is, you know, going about his business, he's not in he's not lying in wait, but say, you know, he's swinging an axe, cutting something with an axe, and the the axe head slings off and kills his neighbor. That's not murder. Uh, he didn't mean to. It wasn't intentional. He God delivered him into his hand, it said. It was an act of God, for God delivered him into his hand. So that's where you get the saying, it was an act of God. You see, he, it, 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 the guy really wasn't responsible. It was an accident. And when that happens, you know, they would have people that was mad at the guy for, for uh, killing their son or daughter or wife or husband, whoever. And they would have come after him to try to kill them. But God had these cities of refuge where they could go, which is talked about in Numbers 35. It's talked about in Deuteronomy 19, 1 through 13. I won't go there, but you could go there. Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 19, 1 through 13. And these were city, these cities of refuge become the appointed place for the manslayer uh, to save him from the revengers of blood. And and they would stay there until the death of the high priest. They would stay there until the death of the high priest of these cities of refuge. He's not a murderer. He didn't mean to do it. But he's still going to have people try to come after him. All right, now look at verse 14. It says, but if, but if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor. Presumptuously means, you know, he made plans to do this. You know, he premeditated this murder. If a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, guile with craft, cunning. It says, thou shalt, ta thou shalt take him from my altar that he may die. So what does that mean? Thou shalt take him from my altar. Well, that means I'm, I'm not a hundred percent, but I think that means it's referring to there's no sacrifice for murder. He couldn't bring something to the altar to get a, a sacrifice for that sin. He's done after that. The only person you see that <clears throat> that got away with that and. And got forgiveness for that was David, and that's why it's called the sure mercies of David. He he committed two sins that didn't have a sacrifice for adultery and murder, and he didn't get killed. He had the sure mercies of David. So I, I think that's what this is referring to. Take him from my altar that he may die. There was no forgiveness for it. You killed somebody, you got to be killed. So, no sacrifices for murder. And then you got murderers of fathers and mothers. Look at verse 15. And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall he surely put to death. And it doesn't actually say that, he, that the person kills them, that the child kills them. It's just saying if you smite them. But obviously you kill them, you kill your parents, you're done. And it's just God sees being disobedient to parents as one of the worst things you can do. That's obvious in the Bible. And Paul goes into it himself in 1 Timothy 1.9. He says, knowing this, 
that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murders of fathers and murders of mothers, for manslayers. So, <clears throat> Paul just backs up the statements from the law here. He even talks about honor thy father and mother. He talks about that in Ephesians. So, so this says if you just smite your father, back here in Exodus 21, 15, you had to be put to death. That's how serious it was disrespecting your parents. If you'll smite your own father or mother, uh, you, you probably got some serious problems going on. Now, I know there's situations where you got abusive parents and maybe you're having to do self-defense and things like that. That's a different story. But, you know, somebody that's they've got good parents and it going up to just hitting their parents, things like that. This doesn't talk this isn't talking about self defense, hitting in self defense or nothing like that. You know, God looks at the intent of the heart. And then it, it says in verse sixteen, and he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. So we're looking at murderers and manslayers. Murderers of fathers and mothers. Now, men stealers. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him. What if you stole a man and sold him? Well, you're put to death. You say, well, he didn't. Maybe what if they didn't kill him? Well, he stole him. And <clears throat> when you, when a man goes up, just like today, and steals a child from their parents at a grocery store, you know, the previous, that morning, that child woke up with its mommy and daddy. And then some Nimrod comes to the grocery store looking for children and steals that child away. You're taking, you're taking the life that they had without killing them. And life isn't the same if they do come back. They're always it's it's different. There's a there's a piece of them gone. Something's different. You're taking their life in a sense. And the all this uh, human trafficking stuff, God sees all that, and they're gonna get judged for that, big time. Hell's gonna be hot. And they think they're getting away with it, but they're not getting away with it. So men stealers, they're put to death. And Paul backs it up, 1 Timothy 1.10. You know, he said in 1 Timothy 1, nine, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. He goes on in verse 10 to say, but for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers. <clears throat> so these people that are kidnapping people, you know, you're taking their life in a sense. What gives you the right to come interfere with another person's life like that in that sense now verse twenty one seventeen, and he that curseth his father or his mother so surely be put to death so in verse 15 it was just if you smite them then in 17 if you cursed them you see how serious god is about this being good to your parents uh, there's just no excuse for it and paul backs it up once again ephesians 6 1 through 3 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. You say, well, if they were doing that, then they were killing children every day. I, I don't think so, because you, if, if all these kids saw this severe punishment coming to a child that hit his parents or cursed his parents, that's a deterrent to it happening again. Most likely, you see a kid get killed for cursing his parents. You're not going to ever curse your parents. Uh, these Don't forget either, these people were... After this, I mean, they're brought up day after day from the time they get up to the time they go to bed. They're being taught this stuff, this law. It's their life. It's not like today where... 
Everything else is a priority. And if you get time, you read the Bible once a week or just at church. This was, they were doing this every day, this learning the law and what Moses taught them. It was a, a day, day by day thing. It wasn't just something they did in their spare time. They did everything else in their spare time. So they would have lived and breathed this. And I, I don't believe that there was as many people put to death as you would think. Now today, you know, you got kids cursing their parents, hitting their parents. <clears throat> You'd have 50,000 kids killed a day, which they're doing that. And they're killing a bunch of kids in abortion, but there'd be 50,000 kids killed a day or something like that. But they weren't raised up under this law either, you see. If they're raised up under this law, seeing what happens to children that do this, most likely there wouldn't be many kids attempting this stuff. Okay, then it says in verse 18, and it says, If men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed. So you got two men fighting, and uh, one of them takes a stone and hits the guy or takes his fist and hits the guy and he doesn't die but keepeth his bed meaning he's he's injured he's sick he's not able to get up and work it says if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff then shall he that smote him be quit you know he's going to be clear of the he's not going to die you know he didn't kill him but only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. So he smote him with something. The guy is in bed. He's bedridden. He can't go and work or do nothing. So the guy that hit him has to pay for his loss of time. And he has to pay for him to be thoroughly healed. And this, <clears throat> I meant to tell you the other heading for this or the other point, name of the point for this would be making things good. You know, you had manslayers, you got masters and servants, and now you got rules for making things good. You know, you need to make things good for people when you do them wrong. You know, he needs to pay for his loss of time. He needs to be, you need to pay for his hospital bills until he's thoroughly healed. And then in verse 20, it says, and if man smite his servant or his maid, now this will go back under the masters and servants category. And if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall be surely punished. So it doesn't, it seems like this was an accidental and it seems like the master was in charge of disciplining the servants and it says in verse 21, notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. You see, if um, he would be punished, but not put to death. And that, But if he continue a day or two, then he wouldn't be punished. Meaning, see, if, if he hits him with the rod and the guy and the servant continues a day or two, then it shows that he didn't have the intent to kill and he wouldn't be punished because the servant was his money. By killing the servant, he was hurting himself because the servant was doing the work for him. So if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished for he is his money. And then... This <clears throat> this next verse will go back under the murderers and manslayers section there. It says in if verse twenty two, if men strive and hurt a woman with child, you go, you got two men fighting and they hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her. You know, she was with child and they hit her and her fruit departs from her. She has the child prematurely. And yet no mischief follow. So mischief following. And yet no mischief follow. You know, she didn't die. The, the child didn't die. He shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. And he shall pay as the judges determined. So if 
no mischief follow. The husband decides what the punishment will be, and then he has to pay as the judge is determined. But then look what it says in verse 23. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. If the woman dies, if the child dies, he has to give life for life. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And he reaps what he sows. Just like Paul says in Galatians 6, Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So, <clears throat> once again, capital punishment for uh, m killing. And this is life for life. If miss you follow, then thou shalt give life for life. <clears throat> now, Look at verse 26. And if men, if if the if a man smite the eye of his servant. Now this will go back under masters and servants. If a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. So there's a loophole there to where you're not even done your six, you're not even done your seven years as a servant. You get to go free if your master punches you in the face and mushes you up. If he punches you in the face, that it perish, your eye perish, then you get to go free for your eye's sake. And if he smite out his manservant's tooth, or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. So you see how the Lord's protecting the servant. You can't you can't hurt him or, or nothing like that. And they got to go free if the master did this. Now, verse 28 is where you get under minding leash laws. What you could compare to like minding leash laws today. You've heard about people are not have, uh, going by the leash laws and they let their animal just run around and do whatever it wants to do. Verse 28 says, If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall be surely stoned. And his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. So if the ox gets loose and gores a man, kills a man or a woman, and they die, the ox has got to be stoned. And the owner of the ox can't eat the flesh, but he'll be quit. You know, it... If the ox unexpectedly goes and kills somebody, the owner can't eat the flesh, but he'll he'll be quit. He he won't have to pay a penalty for what happened. And he couldn't eat the flesh though, because you couldn't eat a stoned ox because the ox's throat had to be cut and the heart had to pump the blood out naturally. And if it was just stoned, then that wouldn't happen. You see, you couldn't eat the flesh with the blood, so he wouldn't be able to eat the ox. But he would be quit. He'd be free. He'd be clear. And he only suffers the complete loss of the ox. Which, that's not a bad deal, seeing your ox just killed somebody. All right, then verse 29, but if the ox were wont to push with his horn in time past, meaning if it was, if it had been known to go and hurt people and things like that, and it hath been testified to his owner, the, meaning the owner knew about it, and he hath not kept him in, he wasn't minding the leash law, but that he had killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. So if you had that ox and that ox got loose and was known to be violent and hurt people, and then that thing gets loose one day and it kills somebody, then you're responsible. And not only does the ox get stoned, but you also get stoned because you knew that it was violent. You knew that it could hurt somebody and you didn't 
make sure that it was locked up. Now, people are like that today with their dogs a lot of times. You hear all the time, not just sometimes, but all the time. I'm hearing about some type of dog getting loose, killing them, kids, and everything else. Uh, I just recently heard about some pit bulls that killed two kids in front of their mom, and she was trying to get them off, and she had to sit and watch her kids die because of the pit bulls. And people really, really get on my nerves with with the over, just the overabundance of love for animals more than they have for people. Like you tell them stories like this and they're like, well, the children probably provoked them. Well, well yeah, that's kids for you. I don't know if you've got kids, but kids do stupid stuff. And... Um, and the, I, I know, obviously, probably maybe the kids did do something to provoke the animals. But still, the those animals have no business being around your kids either. And I know that's going to be one of the most offensive things I've ever said, probably. Because people love their animals so much. <clears throat> but it really... And then people at work have showed me pictures of their newborn baby next to a pit bull. Uh, that that's stupid, and I don't really care if people get mad about me saying that. That's very stupid. Those animals are known to be violent, just like this ox here. That was wont to push with his horn in time past, and hath been testified to his owner. The pit bulls are known to to be vicious, to be uh, like a to attack people you can look it up the most of the dog attacks are pit bulls and things like that and it's pretty much like playing russian roulette with somebody you're 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 letting the dog be around that person maybe it'll attack them maybe it won't attack them but it, it just really it, it annoys me you know because i have kids and then people letting their dogs run around the neighborhood. Keep your dog on a leash. That way it doesn't have a chance of coming and biting my kid's face off. <clears throat> you got people that they get these dogs and they'll, they'll love on them and pet them for about two weeks. Once the newness and cuteness is wore off, they let them run around all over the neighborhood. Pit bulls, German shepherds. Rottweilers and everything else. Put your dog on a leash. Don't make it everybody else's problem. It's like you, uh, people get so lazy with their animals and they want their animal to become everybody else's problem. Keep your animal on a leash if you're going to have that animal. And if you're going to have something like a pit bull and all this stuff, you need to keep it locked up. Don't be letting it roam around and possibly eat up everybody's kids and and everything else. <clears throat> so if the ox were want to push with his horn in time past and hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner also shall be put to death. So he was responsible because he knew the ox that, that certain ox he had was prone to be violent and if there be then it says if if there be laid on him a sum of money then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him so say the 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 victim's uh father or something says don't put him to death but i'm going to put on him this sum of money that he has to pay instead then he has to pay for the ransom of his life and and doesn't get put to death whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment, shall it be done unto him. So whatever the father decides, maybe a ransom of his life or put to death, whatever it may be. But if the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto their master 
30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. So if the ox kills uh, someone's manservant or someone's maidservant, then the owner of the ox has to give the master 30 shekels of silver, and then the ox has to be stoned. And that pictures the Lord Jesus. As soon as you see that 30 shekels of silver, that ought to remind you of the Lord Jesus. You see, Jesus Christ is the manservant. He's the one that came down and took on the likeness of a servant. The ox pictures those unclean spirits coming against him while he was on the cross. And of course, the reimbursement for Jesus is 30 shekels of silver. But yeah, look at Psalm 22, 12. Psalm 22, 12. And I'm going to show you, and you know this is the crucifixion song, psalm. It says, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Those ox, that uh, the ox pictures the unclean spirits that were contending with the Lord Jesus while he was on the cross. The 30 shekels of silver picturing how Jesus Christ is sold, sold for 30 pieces of silver, Matthew 26, 15. And the maidservant picturing the Lord Jesus Christ who took upon him the form of a servant. Now verse 33, And if a man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit, and not cover it, and an ox or an ass fall therein, now this is going to go back under the making things good rule. If you know if he's got a if he opens a pit, if he digs a hole or something, makes a pit and doesn't cover it up, and somebody falls in it or somebody's animal falls in it, the owner of the pit shall notice the phrase "make it good." That's where you get that common saying: you need to make things good between you and some other somebody else. The owner of the pit shall make it good and give money unto the owner of them, and the dead beast shall be his. So if you if he digged a pit and then somebody's animal falls into it and it dies and it's no good no more, obviously, then he needs to make things good. If something like this happens in your life, you need to make things good. You know, like some type of accident that you're the cause of it and it costs somebody else a bunch of money or something like that, you need to make it good. Walk honestly. And give money unto the owner of whoever it was that you messed with, whatever they have. And it says the dead beast shall be his. So the the guy who dig the pit has to deal with whatever he's going to do with the beast. Which he wouldn't have been able to eat it because it wasn't killed in the right way. So... It says in verse 35, And if one man's ox hurt another's, that he die, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it, and the dead ox also they shall divide. So you could put this under, still making things good, but still under the minding leash law, because if your ox gets out and hurts somebody else's and kills it, then you got to sell the live ox and divide the money of it. And the dead ox also they shall divide. Or if it's if it be known that the ox hath used to push in time past, meaning you know this was a violent animal, and his owner hath not kept him in, then he shall surely be he, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead shall be his own. So if it's known to push, it's been known that this animal is violent. And the owner had not kept him in. He didn't mind no leash laws. He he don't know how to put him in a fence. He don't know how to keep tabs on him, make sure that he's not running around hurting people or hurting other animals. He's got to pay ox for ox. And the dead shall be his own. He's got to give a, an, a new ox to the owner of the ox that got killed. And then... He's got to deal with getting rid of the dead ox, which you can't eat because it wasn't killed the right way. So you just see how, you know, 
people look, look at the Bible and say, wow, the, Bible's got so, the Bible has so many rules. But notice that all the rules are about just treating people the right way. Staying in your lane. Not hurting anybody else. Doing what you're supposed to do. Making things good. I mean, look at the rules of the masters and servants. Masters weren't allowed to treat their servants bad. You look at the manslayers and the murderers. The murderers, you can't just go around murdering people. You want somebody to just be able to run up in your house and kill you while you're sitting on the couch? Uh, and manslayers, you accidentally kill somebody on an accident... You shouldn't have to be put to death for that. Um, you think about the mining leash laws. You want you want to have to deal with, you know, anybody just being able to have an animal that can do anything at once, and if it kills you, oh well, nothing's done about it. Or don't you want people making things good when they do you wrong? You see, it's all about loving God. And if you love God, you'll love your neighbor as yourself because God made you and God made your neighbor. You wrong people, you're wrong in the people that God made. And God's just trying to get through to them. Do the right thing. Stay in your lane. Don't hurt people. And th these are really good rules to follow. Even today, you think about it. I mean, the minding leash laws, making things good. Obviously, you kill somebody, you can expect that you should be killed as well.